seconds and one after it, changing ones, third and fourth genders in Native North America. By then, I had gone back to graduate school and received my PhD in History of Consciousness from UC Santa Cruz. But Harry's research and his constant dialogue continued to spur me. Harry had drawn my attention to non-Western patterns of homosexuality and to the voices of indigenous and people of color not being included in LGBT <coughs> studies. That led me to work on two other projects, Stephen Murray's Islamic Homosexualities and Boy Wives and Female Husbands Studies in African Homosexualities, works that still stand as rather lonely hilltops on a barren plain. And like Harry, I found that my scholarly interests led to indeed demanded activism. For nearly 10 years, I worked with the Gary American Indians organization in San Francisco, learning how to make fry bread, attending powwows and memorials for the many members lost to AIDS, and laughing until my side hurts at stories told late the night about that crazy trickster, the white man. In 1995, I published Queer Spirits, a collection of myths and folklore with an exploration of gay psychological archetypes. Both Harry and John made many contributions to that project. My last book, Jesus in the Shamanic Tradition of Same-Sex Love, is the most deeply influenced by Harry and the most like him, that is to say, over-the-top, speculative, and quixotic. <laughs> <laughs> I try to carry for not only Harry's thinking about subject-subject consciousness, but what I learned in the course of the HIV epidemic. It's been several years now since my travels with Harry, John, and Brad came to an end, Brad succumbed to AIDS in 1996. Harry and John are gone. Tonight I stand here not as a scholar or writer, but as a witness. A witness to two epic events in LGBT history, which is my job to remember. The epidemic and Harry Hay. As Bradley wrote in his journal the day, days before he died, what I like, what I'm drawn to, the intense, fascinating glamour of the world is its totality, light and dark, life and death, pain and pleasure. Well, it's my great pleasure and honor to be your witness tonight for the happiest part of my life, my adventures with Harry Hay. <clears throat> On August 10, 1948, Harry Hay wrote a prospectus that anticipated the goals, forms, and institutions of today's international lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender movement to an extent that was truly prophetic. And for six decades, <clears throat> he brooded over this new movement as it sputtered to life, um, nudging it to its feet in the 1950s, stealing its resolve in the 1960s, challenging it to claim its rightful place among the great causes of our time, until 2002, when still grumbling and grousing, still issuing alarms and calls, his brow furrowed at the horizon, he passed. He was 90. Up close, Harry's life is trees swaying in a turbulent wind, but from the ridges above it is a forest rich and verdant. Creating a movement to secure the human dignity of sexual minorities was his vision. <clears throat> Finding a manic brotherhood of gay comrades in which to live and learn, which he first imagined as a young man working shoulder to shoulder with wobblies in the fields of Nevada, was his dream and he realized both. Harry died in the arms of his beloved radical fairies with the love of his life, John Burnside, by his side. These two boys, for nearly four decades, were together clinging, never leaving, excursions making, fulfilling their foray, and walking to the Harry's birth. Let us celebrate not only the triumph of his life, but as well all that our movement has achieved in the span of a single lifetime. From a bold proposal typed in the wee hours of the morning to a movement of international scope and influence. Today, our dignity is affirmed by presidents, nations, world organizations, and our cause, freedom from hate, liberation from shame, captures the imagination of everyone who yearns to be free. Welcome to Glee Nation. <laughs> Tonight, I want to talk about the importance of Harry Hay, his activism and ideas, and the adventure that awaits those willing to engage this remarkable body of work. It's a radical enterprise, in the sense of the word that Harry liked to point out, to the root. For in exploring Harry's life, we will return, no, we will be, we will return to the roots of LGBT liberation, contemplating not only its proximate causes and circumstances, but as well, 
the nature of the inner conflict that finds its resolution in an act of sheer audacity, declaring an identity, signing up for a cause. When it comes to our movement's origins, Harry Hay is the taproot. I'm not claiming for him the title of founder, as if that were a championship title. And I'm not calling him our Martin Luther King Jr. or Cesar Chavez or Dolores Huerta or Robert Morgan. He is simply our Harry Hay, a leader of equal stature, but in a style specific to our community. And if you have difficulty putting together the idea of major historical figure and really big queen, <laughs> you've come to the right place. <laughs> because I will argue that this drama queen, in his holy fool outfit of jeans and camouflage skirt and fake pearls, ranks among the most inspiring and courageous civil rights leaders in American history. In the 1950s, dancers, 
political figures and others Harry had known, a who's who of Bohemian Los Angeles in the mid-20th century, and the causes from unionism to the Spanish Civil War to civil rights. Harry joined them all, and he continued making high-profile interventions into LGBT talk politics well into the 70s and 80s, whenever he felt voices were being excluded. But even with all this, Harry's intellectual and literary output remained virtually unknown, and so in 1996, to fill in one more part of the story, I published a collection of Harry's writings called Radically Gay. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the man has cred. He talked it. He walked it. He pranced it. I, I think I meant to type practiced it. <laughs> but I felt like pranced, so we'll leave it like that. He did not make money off of it. He did not seek a title for it or earn a salary when he did it. He fundamentally got racism, sexism, patriarchy, heterosexism, and class. And in his later years, he got anarchism, leather, sort of, and mushrooms. <laughs> Harry Hay is the real deal, and to my mind, the best kind of hero, because like Harvey Mill, he has so many flaws. He can't be followed, he keeps changing lanes. And if you should happen to think for a moment that he's the greatest gay guy since Whitman or Plato, you will be disabused. He stabs your, your chest with his finger to make a point. He fails to live up to, to his own ideals. He storms out of the room in a fit of pique. Your projections never get a chance to take hold. But above all, Harry got queer liberation. And his greatest contribution was the breakthrough, <clears throat> one after years of self-examination and inquiry, that enabled him to see in queer folks a people. We're together in this room tonight because we all have some kind of relationship to a group of people known as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. It is almost impossible for us to imagine the consciousness of those living in a time when there simply was no such group, not in the minds of those who engaged in homosexuality or whose gender was different, not in the language of the time. As Harry so often pointed out to any who would listen, when he was a young man, there was no word for talking about us, no common term that didn't amount to maledictum or provoke nervous giggles. We were that way, sensitive, touched. We were aunties, nancies, or rough trade. Nothing frustrated Harry more than the anachronistic projection of our modern self-awareness onto the times he lived as a young man. He would have bristled at the title of tonight's play, The Temperamentals, a term only used as an adjective in his time. Harry's point is that the leap from adjective to noun had not been made, and until it had, queers did not and could not think about themselves in collective ways. It was literally unthinkable. In the 1930s, when Harry proposed to his boyfriend, Will Gear, the leftist actor who ended his career playing Grandpa Walton, that they start a society of us and have serious discussions, Gear snapped back, but honey, what will we talk about? <laughs> Gear was putting it politely. Henry Gerber's comments, a leftist like Harry, who also tried to call the meeting in Chicago in the 1920s, but was soon arrested, provides a blunter appraisal of the prospects Harry faced. The first difficulty, Gerber recalled, was in rounding up enough members and contributors so the work could go forward. The average homosexual, I found, was ignorant concerning himself. Others were fearful. Still others were frantic or depraved. Some were blasé. Many homosexuals told me that their search for forbidden fruit was the real spice of life. With this argument, they rejected our aims. We wondered how we could accomplish anything with such resistance from our own people. So how do you call a meeting of a group of people who call each other the friends of Dorothy? <coughs> and please remember, while the baleful influence of the medical model was already bearing down on queer self-esteem in these years, the word homosexual was not in common American dictionaries and would not be for another decade. Looking back now, Harry's faith in the possibility of loving ourselves and each other and his intuition that the powerful act of self-redemption we call coming out could unleash immense energies for social change seems all the more visionary. He knew that having an answer to the medical model was not enough. And indeed, the Manstein founders wasted little time thinking of arguments for psychiatrists. Will Gear's question was the Gordian knot that had to be cut before there could be a movement. 
The answer came in 1948. <clears throat> the story is apocryphal, but it bears repeating. That August, Harry attended a party and turned out to be all gay men. He had a copy of the Kinsey Report under his arm, and he had just come from signing a petition to place Henry Wallace's name as a candidate for president on the California ballot. Beer flowed, talk followed, and that night, a new idea was born. Now, Wallace's third party candidacy was drawing support from many activists like Harry, whose roots lie in the popular front politics of the 1930s and 40s. This was the period when American communists forged alliances with a wide range of groups that opposed fascism and the worst skills of capitalism. In America, opposing fascism meant fighting racism and aiding those targeted by it, especially African Americans. The party lent aid to African American causes and organizations, and wide-ranging discussions among party intellectuals extended Marxist principles to make the case that cultural, racial, and ethnic minorities had common cause with the working class, over and against an older view that considered minorities the byproduct of capitalism's attempt to divide and conquer. In Southern California, not uniquely, but especially, African Americans were one of several groups experiencing racism, and they all had a common enemy in brutally repressive law enforcement agencies and local governments dominated by business interests. The commies worked with them all. And so, in mid-20th century Los Angeles, as Daniel Hurwitz shows in his marvelous book, we see the chrysalis of what was to come, multiculturalism, an analysis of the relationship between class and racism and sexism, and the ever-shifting coalitional politics that are now so characteristic of the American city. Meanwhile, at a party at an apartment in LA, the discussion ranged from Kinsey and his startling re revelation of the frequency of homosexuality, to the Wallace campaign. Harry tossed out the idea that a discreet organization, calling itself perhaps Bachelors of Wallace, Bachelors for Wallace, could lobby for a plank in the platform supporting the right to privacy. The idea took off. But at dawn's early light, when the revelers straggled home to sleep it off, Harry was pouring coffee and sitting down at the typewriter. <clears throat> when he pulled out the last sheet of paper, he had created a prospectus of brazen scope. It projected an organization that would engage in full-out civil rights advocacy, provide social and legal services, have a research and education division, and offer social and cultural activities. And if that were bold enough, the prospectus had the audacity to cite in its support two of the major international statements on human rights of the World War II era, the Atlantic Charter and that of the United Nations. And in this text, Harry used the word minority 14 times. Here as androgynous minority, but that qualifier was soon replaced with homophile or homosexual, then later gay, fairy, third gender, and others. But the denominator was always minority. And this is new. <laughs> the other Mattershein organizers challenged him to flesh out the idea. Chuck Rowland, and Chuck, by the way, besides being one of the sweetest men you could have ever known, played a role in Mattershein no less important than Harry's. Chuck recalled, I kept saying, what is our theory? Having been a communist, you've got to work with a theory. What is our basic principle that we're building on? And Harry said, we are an oppressed cultural minority. And I said, that's exactly it. Harry's ideas were discussed extensively by the founders, interminably, some of them remembered, <laughs> at discussion groups and in presentations by Harry. When the group adopted a mission statement in 1951, homosexual referred to as an oppressed minority. The organizers put the theory to practice. The thesis states we are a group, so discussions were centered around questions the thesis generates. What do we have in common? What experiences do we share? How can we help each other? The results were powerfully cathartic, and by 1953, the discussion groups had gone viral. The most fully developed version of the thesis is in notes Harry wrote in 1960. He begins, he begins by borrowing the definition of cultural minorities from a text he used in his Marxist classes and one often cited in the party's discussion about African Americans, which states, a nation, which here has the sense of a people or minority within a larger state, is a historically evolved, stable community of language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a community of culture. 
No single characteristic is determinative in constituting a minority, only a sum total of characteristics of which, when nations are compared, one characteristic, national character, or another, language, or a third, territory, economic conditions, stands out in sharper relief. As Harry sums it up, all groups whose motivating persuasions and or fundamental inclinations evoke decisive patterns toward a socially specific way of life are to be seen as social minorities. Harry provides several examples to show the variety of ways in which minority identities could be constituted and then creatively reformulated to survive over time. Two were especially key to his argument. The Nisai were the Japanese Americans interned during World War II, a racist policy the communists like Harry had protested. <clears throat> had the Nisai been deported to Japan as was threatened, Harry observes, their American outlook would have marked them as a minority there as well, even though they remained racially and linguistically Japanese. Similarly, the former American slaves who established a colony in Liberia were black but no longer African. They became a minority within the nation they created. In each case, social and historical contingencies trump essential traits. Now, Harry turns to the case of modern homosexuals. They do not come from a single race or have a single language. They do not have cross-generational kinship systems. But Harry argues that they have two of the four variables in his paradigm, <clears throat> a shared psychological makeup or outlook, and distinctive modes of communication. In light of his brief examples, this is enough. As for the other variables, Harry notes, they can be historically constituted. Now, <clears throat> I call this the cultural minority light thesis, or fumbling for a more precise term, the existential version. It says that our common experiences of being queer, facing hostile families and communities, learning strategies for surviving, hooking up with others like us, and the values that accrue from these experiences provide common bonds for a movement and the seeds of a culture. This light version of Harry's thesis does not depend on transcendental claims regarding a continuous past or essential traits. It cannot be accused of essentialism in the way that straw figure is usually held up. But as Harry's thinking developed, he elaborated this into what I call the full-on or transcendental version of the cultural minority thesis. While more controversial and easily stereotyped, I think it is a richer, more provocative hypothesis than that that is afforded by the existential version, and it is equally grounded in Marxist thinking. Already, by 1960, Harry's research had convinced him that we had a place in history that transcended modernity. And here is where the two examples Harry cited so often were key. The so-called two-spirit worker gosh of uh, roles of Native North America, which have many parallels worldwide, and the fool a folkloric figure in Renaissance Europe that Harry believed was a survival of an ancient, pre-Christian, agrarian village role. Harry concluded that these roles, beyond all their elements that strike us as exotic, involved craft and religious specialization. Crafts, being tied to production, religion, being connected to the distribution of surpluses, this means that these roles are not an epiphenomena of the superstructure, but integral to the subject of Marxism the social relations of production. And as I note in changing ones, what we see in these roles is one way that pre-class societies of the gender division of labor accommodate increased specialization by multiplying genders. Now, all this is good historical materialism, but once placed in the kind of grand scheme of Marx and Engels, from tribes to feudalism to capitalism to utopia, it becomes a transcendental claim with all its baggage. But I would argue that Harry's amendments to Marxian historiography are so provocative, they're worth revisiting. Sadly, <coughs> if the cultural minority thesis is known at all, it is by the stereotypes of its critics. And indeed, it is not an exaggeration to say that careers have been built on decrying this very notion that we are a minority or have a culture. Our diversity, random distribution, and divisiveness clearly refuted. And this notion of identity, why it's a category error, a phantasm, an altruistic interpolation, false consciousness, in Jeffrey Weeks' words, a historical fiction, a controlling myth, a limiting burden. <laughs> you know, when I hear this kind of thing, I can't help but hear the echoes of Plato's account.
account of the soul yearning to escape the prison of the body and soar free in the heavenly aether of fluid identities, fluid sexualities, and fluid genders. Kind of like taking a cruise in tropical waters with lots of gay sex, but everyone has to take a vow of silence. <laughs> but a real debate between Harry Hay and anti-identitarian queer theory has never been held as far as I'm concerned. So, let's do this thing now. Right here, let's have a smackdown in Roshansky Auditorium. <laughs>
Harry is saying it's no binary at all, because one term, heterosexual, is always already dominant. Homosexual is neither symmetrical to nor independent from heterosexual. It is merely its inferior, its subaltern, a parodic knockoff of the heterosexual. Its production serves merely to perfect the idealized presence of the dominant term. Harry, in rejecting the ontological claims Foucault makes for medical discourse, initiates a deconstruction of this binary that follows exactly the methodology of Jacques Derrida. First, he points out, he point, pinpoints the rupture that reveals its hierarchy. The characterization of the homosexual as inverting masculine and feminine terms that depend on and presuppose heterosexuality. The homosexual is merely the internalization of heterosexuality's division of labor, a bad dream of an imaginary that longs for the unity of its opposites. Harry postulates instead not an opposition or a synthesis, but a supplement that is neither or both parts of the opposition. This is what he's doing when he insists that we are neither hetero-male nor hetero-female, that we are not men and not women, or that we are characterized by neitherness. Note the play and the undecidability. Rather than perfect the presence of the privileged term, they reveal the absences within it. And by continually reformulating the supplement before it can be amplified to a stability, Harry creates a discourse of identity that refuses assimilation and reintegration, resists binaries, disrupts hierarchies. Yes, homosexuals constructed perverts so that they could be controlled. True that, as far as it goes. But homosexual did not make us persons. It made us subhumans, just as racism made subhumans of people of color. Harry's cultural perspective upsets the Foucaultian apple cart. It asserts an ontological status not derived from, parallel to, or a reversal of heterosexuality, but just of it. What other? As Harry wrote in 1970, let us enter this brave new world of subject-subject consciousness, this new planet of fairy vision, and find out. And please note, what really separates Foucault and Hay is not constructionism versus essentialism. These are two versions of social constructionism. What distinguishes them are very different views of power. In Foucault, it's all top-down. Medical authorities write it, states enforce it, and bodies, in the moment of becoming subjects, are subjugated. But it's tautological, since discourse theory does not require embodied actors, this does not find it necessary to write evidence regarding who read these texts and if it mattered. For Harry, identity construction is creative, political, transactional, and it is active. Identities are the result of identifying. What Harry is saying, long story short, is this. Juridical medical discourse did not construct our identities. Excuse me? We did that. <laughs> this debate might have actually happened when both men were alive if Mattershein had not been eviscerated in 1953 and Harry relegated to obscurity. But when Stonewall occurred, Harry's thinking was not available, not a school of thought, not a book to cite. This does not diminish its significance, however. Instead, it gives us an opportunity to test it in another way. That is, how well does this thesis, developed in the early 1950s, predict and describe what eventually followed in the 1970s? By the time of Stonewall, I would argue that the idea that we are a group had become self-evident. And this watershed occurred as a result of the growing migration of LGBT people to urban centers and the relentless persecution they faced when they got there. By 1969, it had become clear that society was out to get us, and we were in it together. Will Gear's question was moot. The 1970s saw a period of intense institution building in which everything envisioned in Gear's perspectives was realized in one form or another. And all the organizations and agencies, the businesses and marketing schemes, political clubs and churches, parades and pop culture, and of course I should mention social media, all these presume a group of people, you have to mention social media, all these premise a group of people who have not one but various needs and interests, which they meet in whole or part by identifying with a group, a social minority by any other name. As for politics, Madison called for queers to organize themselves and seek power within the terms of the existing bourgeois democracy, what I call progressive identity politics. Here's how Harry put it, speaking to an audience of leftists in the 
1990s. We queers, having won our autonomy with no help from anybody, shall continue to maintain that autonomy. We shall be happy to walk with any group as long as we and they remain in a loving, sharing consensus. But the moment the consensus breaks, exercising our ancient prerogatives to totally self-reliant independence, we fairies vanish. Well, if Harry Hay is the theory, Harvey Milk was the practice. I met Harvey in early 1978 in his tiny office at City Hall. He gleefully described what he was able to do with his new powers as a supervisor. He could have a letter written to the chief of police, and the chief was legally required to reply. From being free to ignore us to being required to reply is what power means. One of Harvey's apocryphal stories is about the day following his election when he strode into Mayor Moscone's office, thumped on his desk, and announced, I'm the queen now, and if you want to get reelected with gay support, you need to deal with me. <laughs> the message is the same as Harry's. We will walk with you, but no more divide and conquer, no more co-optation, no more voting us down because we're only 10% of your membership. Treat us individually as individuals, but when it comes to politics, we're a community. Since Stonewall, the existential model of LGBT identity has been enough to unite us. It has given us an effective civil rights movement, a lively culture of resistance, and bonds of amazing strength that sustained us through the AIDS epidemic. But Harry believed LGBT people had a deeper yearning to see themselves as having a meaningful place in the human story. The title of his never-finished book was to have been The Homosexual in Search of Historical Contiguity. In the 1970s, he sensed that the existential gay community, the community organized around consumption, disposable income, and shopping and dining districts, was not addressing the alienation many gay men still experienced, or was deepening it. A doubt remains at the core. If I'm not sick or deviant, if I'm normal, why don't I have a history? And if I'm different, what's the purpose of it? The response to the call put out by Harry, John, Don Kel Hefner, and Mitch Walker in 1979 for gay men to explore these themes revealed the depth of this journey, and the radical fairy development began. BTW, that's what Harry called it, a development. But I want to emphasize one point. Harry's thinking encompasses either and both of these the minority light version grounded in the existential experience of being queer in America, and the full-on transcendental version grounding us in the broadest narratives of human history. <laughs> Both affirm identity. Both affirm progressive identity politics. Harry Hay has been saved from obscurity. We won't forget him again. But of his full import, the verdict is still out. Our greatest adventures with Harry Hay lie ahead. Harry's book, Radically Gay, is merely a plate of a musée bouche meant to awaken your palate. In archives in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and elsewhere, and in private collections, who knows where, lies a vast trove. Thousands of pages of notes and manuscripts, research materials, letters, documents, photographs, and more. And as is fitting for a man who was one of the great roncateurs of all time, there are hundreds of hours of oral history, interviews, videotapes, and films. Here is where the legacy of Harry waits to be found. There are literary works, poetry, fiction, screenplays, lyrics, and stories from the 1930s, and rough manuscripts from the period when Harry was a Marxist teacher. There is Harry's research into music history during his involvement with people's songs. Stuart Timmons counted over 500 citations and musical examples in Harry's notes, which culminated in a popular course called Music, the Barometer of Class Struggle. This was nothing less than a complete recapitulation of European history with analysis of the relationship between music, <laughs> social organization, and resistance. Harry was a major opera queen, and he collected every recording he could get by gay composers or composers he suspected were gay, finding in the formal aspects of their music evidence of what he called the gay window. Much of this collection now resides at the Southern California Library for Social Studies and Research. In the 1950s, building on his insight into the economic and religious spirit specialization of two-spirit roles, Harry asked if similar roles could be found in the prehistoric societies of the old world. This led to even 
more extensive research in fields ranging from history to archaeology and anthropology, biblical studies, and folklore. His writings in these years are peppered with names like Robert Graves, Joseph Campbell, James Frazier, Jane Harrison, E.P. Thompson, Gordon Child, Ruth Benedict, Alfred Kroeber, Lionel Trilling, Edward Carpenter, Robert Pfeiffer, and many more. In the 1960s, he dipped as well into ethology and sociobiology, admired the work of Conrad Lorenz, and made nuanced speculations on the substrates of homosexual behavior and orientation. <coughs> Harry's work is a powerful resource for querying some of the leading intellectual debates of the 20th century. When you read his notes and commentaries, it's as if you're suddenly <coughs> hearing a very smart, very gay voice interjected into a conversation that, when it first occurred, excluded us, along with a bunch of other folks, too. <clears throat> Harry's papers are a resource as well for anyone researching the many causes and groups he was involved in. Two histories of people's songs, for example, make no mention of Harry's significant contributions in Southern California. There needs to be a do-over. We deserve so much more research on Mattachine and the homophile period and its pioneers, and Harry's papers are a resource for this as well. Now, it needs to be said that Harry does not come with a user-friendly interface. <clears throat> he writes like he drove, willfully refusing to observe discursive regimes, genres, <coughs> registers, and typographical conventions. <laughs> At least the handwriting is always neat. <clears throat> but it's worth the effort. Whenever he found that an authority, whether a scholar or a community leader, had ignored, misinterpreted, or dismissed evidence concerning homosexuality, he would say, if they got that wrong, what else <coughs> did they get wrong? Well, I think we should turn that upside down and back around onto Harry and ask, considering his achievements, if he got that right, what else did he get right? <clears throat> Many of us here knew Harry, but none of us knew him before he was an old man. We can't help but think of him and the image he chose to cultivate in those years, our dear, old, eccentric, brave, quirky, fairy elder. Harry, I'm calling you out on that now. Some frog skins are pretty, especially the ones with pink tutus, but it's time to shed your coy disguise and let us see the shining prince beneath. For truly, this prince is one of the towering intellectuals of LGBT liberation. <clears throat> now, before we started tonight, maybe we'll have occasion to play it again. We played a song. It was a bad recording, filled with scratches and screeches. It's from a cassette tape Harry gave to Brad and me years ago, and it's a version of an old folk song used by Dutch patriots in their wars with the Spaniards, and by the Dutch resistance in World War II. This was the song that the Mattachine founders played during their membership initiation, and the recording you heard is from the very record they used, one of Harry's 78s. If you can recall the two, maybe close your eyes, perhaps you can imagine what it sounded like loud and what it was like to be standing in a small circle in a small house in Los Angeles, the blinds closed, a pillow over the telephone because it might be bugged. You're holding hands with six other people who love the same sex. And you know that what you're doing could cost you everything. Police bursting through the door this very moment is not out of the range of possibilities. And this is not Franco's Spain or Stalin's USSR. This is America in 1950. Fathers Knows Best is on the television and McCarthy's in the news. Homosexuals do not have the right to assemble. They do not have freedom of speech or press. And they are not equal under any law anywhere. But perhaps you've decided to hope for the best. And so you hold hands. This is as deep as commitment gets. I ask you to take this pledge in your hearts tonight, to make the same deep commitment to never again let a story like Vanishing be forgotten, or let a younger generation doubt for a minute that LGBT people aren't present in the world. We've made a promise, it gets better. Well, as Harry would put it, it better. We need to explore our movement tenfold in the next 10 years and make sure that every gay Young gay person who watches Glee and lip syncs Lady Gaga and hears our call and comes out in high school, in middle school, in the crib, 
has a support network. We need to form a circle that links generations and swear to never let it be broken. In the words that our founders pledged six decades ago, our interlocking, sustaining, and protecting hands guarantee a reborn social force of immense and simple purpose. We are sworn that no boy or girl approaching the maelstrom of being different need make that crossing alone, afraid and in the dark, ever again. Welcome to Planet Ferry. I hope you have a great time. Enjoy yourselves. Talk, laugh, help lots. You're fabulous. Thank you.